Hi folks, I wanted to take a minute to describe for you another experiment that we're going to end up doing virtually. It's called the E over M experiment for historical reasons. At the time the experiment was done, there was no way to tell the, either the electron charge or the electron mass, but the experiment only revealed the ratio between the two. Subsequently, Millikan, in his famous oil drop experiment, determined the charge on the electron, which we now use all the time, and so we could, for the purposes of our experiment, call it the mass of the electron experiment instead of the E over M ratio. Um, so we'll just think of it as measuring the mass of the electron. So, uh, but before we begin that, I want to talk about the magnetic field produced by the coils in this experiment. So, in particular, uh, let's see. This thing never wants to focus, it seems like. Okay, there we go. Um, <clears throat> let's just imagine a single coil. If you think about the current flowing in this coil, let's say the current's flowing down in the front and up in the back. So at the top of the page, the current's flowing out at me. At the bottom of the page, current's flowing in. Okay, so that's the current direction. If I look on the axis of the coil, let's say out here somewhere, the distance from that little chunk of wire is going to be r. Let's call it little r. <clears throat> It's called the distance to the point from the center of the coil. Let's call that Z. And then this guy, the radius of the coil, we'll call that capital R. Okay. Now, uh, our hat is going to point along the direction between the chunk of current and the point where the magnetic field is being produced. And DL points out of the page. DL cross R hat is going to point this way. So this is going to be uh, DL cross R hat, right? But we know that the magnetic field produced by that little guy, it's going to be mu zero over four pi times the current times DL crossed into R hat divided by the magnitude of the R vector squared. That's the Bios of Art law. We've been using it a lot. I want to point out that this angle, this angle here, is exactly the same as this angle because as uh, if you imagine moving this guy out the angle this angle approaches 90 degrees but this angle if you move out here that angle is also going to approach 90 degrees so those two have to be the same uh, another way to look at it is uh, this this is 90 degrees this angle plus that angle have to be 90 degrees. So that means, and we know from the triangle here, these two have to add up to 90. So that means those guys have to be the same. Okay, now when you add up the magnetic field due to all the chunks of current around that loop, of course, the only thing that's going to survive is this component parallel to the z-axis <clears throat> in the z-direction, I guess you could say. So that means that by the time you take the z component, so if I get rid of the vector here, and I make this dBz, the z component, all I have to do is multiply by the cosine of that angle. So the cosine of that angle. Um, but wait a minute. This has a distance r here. Uh, the cosine of the angle is just going to be big R divided by little r. <clears throat> okay? Um, that's just trigonometry. Um, but hang on a minute. Uh, the contribution from each of the z component of the contribution from each of these chunks is going to be the same. So when I go to do the integral, everything here is going to stay the same. I'm just going to end up with the integral of dl. And the integral of dl, of course, is just 2 pi r. So when I integrate this thing, <clears throat> all I have to do is uh, I've already taken care of the direction, so I can get rid of all this. This just becomes 2 pi r. But that makes, just makes that an r squared. Okay, so this is getting pretty simple. That means that this is mu zero over 4 pi times 2 times the pi r squared, the area of that loop, times the current through the wire. This, you'll notice, is nothing other than the dipole moment mu of that loop. And all I have to do is multiply by magnitude r. And that turns out to be an exact result. <clears throat> now, when z is much less than big R, of course, r cubed is going to be mostly just big R. 
and z is much greater than big R, R cubed is going to be basically just z. So, and that, in fact, so we have two limits here that are interesting. We have the limit when z is much, much greater than r, and this thing becomes mu0 over 4 pi, uh, twice the dipole moment of that loop, divided by z cubed, right? And, of course, we have uh, the other situation is when z is not much greater than r. In that case, um, we're going to get still mu0 over 4 pi. Still going to get the 2. Still going to get the mu vector. But down here, instead of z cubed, it's going to be r cubed. It's going to be r cubed. But wait a minute. What is r? r is the square root of z squared plus r squared. So I can just put that in here. z squared plus r squared square root but it's got to be cubed here, so it's going to be 3 halves. <clears throat> okay, so that's the... Now, you may remember, we actually worked this out before. Let's see if I can find it. Indeed, there it is. That is the magnetic field due to a loop. I just wanted to remind you how it, where it comes from. You can see how it goes. And it's actually relevant because uh, in this week's laboratory, we're going to be using a... Uh, a set of coils, very much like this. So let's go ahead and let's uh, let's look at this again. So we have that's a general result. Okay. Um, let's take that and use it to analyze the coils for this week. So I'm just going to take this result. B z is mu zero over four pi. <clears throat> Twice the dipole moment of the loop divided by um, and let's just write it as r cubed. We know r is that hy hypotenuse of that darn triangle. And then let's look at the experiment. Whoops, I should put it. Okay, let's look at the, uh, the actual situation in the lab. We're going to have a coil just like we had before, but it's going to have a it's going to have a radius big R. That's this distance. <clears throat> but interestingly. A distance r away from that coil, we're going to put another coil. So this distance is also going to be r. <clears throat> okay? And uh, that means, and the experiment happens right in the middle between the two coils. The reason we do that is because it turns out when you have a configuration of two coils like this, both with a radius of big R, separated by a distance that happens to be equal to the radius of the coils, you can show that the magnetic field is extremely uniform in this region near the center. Uh, it turns out not only is the first derivative of the magnetic field as a function of distance between the two coils go to zero at the midpoint, the second derivative does as well. And the magnetic field transverse to the axis, perpendicular to the axis, is also very uniform. So it makes it great for doing experiments because it means I don't have to have everything exactly in the middle. I can still get a pretty good estimate of the magnetic field in the neighborhood of the experiment. Because my experiment is not infinitely small. It's got a finite size. Okay. So uh, let's use this expression to figure out the magnetic field from one loop of wire here. Uh, z is just going to, I'm just going to make z equal to r over 2. This distance is r. That makes the little r, what is little r going to be? It's the square root of z squared plus r squared. But hang on, because z is r over 2, because I'm halfway across between the two coils. So that's going to be r over 2 squared plus r squared. Um, let's see. If I move this over here a little bit, I can make myself some room. That's the square root of r squared over 4. And I'm going to write this as 4. 4r squared over 4, same thing. And you can see that that becomes simply the square root of 5r squared over 4. But that's the square root of 5 times r over 2. Okay, that's what that guy is. <clears throat> now, uh, this is little r. But wait a minute, little r is what shows up over here. Let's go back up here. So I'm going to put this in for little r. This becomes mu0 
over 4 pi, 2 mu. And then for little r, I'm going to put the square root of 5, r over 2, but it's got to be cubed in this expression. <clears throat> well, if you cube 5, that's 125. Um, if you cube r, that's r cubed. And uh, if you, uh, let's see, what else we got here? And if you cube 2, that's 8. So what I'm going to end up with is... Uh, mu zero over four pi, and then I'm going to get um, two mu. I'll get an eight from that two downstairs. I'll get a square root of 125, and then I'll get a big R cubed. Okay, so that's the that's the monstrosity. That's for one loop of wire, one loop of wire. And don't forget what mu is. Mu is the current times the area of the loop pi r squared pi big r squared okay so let's uh let's actually take this result i'm going to move it down here b for one loop is mu zero over four pi i'll make a 16 what is mu mu is i pi r squared that's mu I, got a, I already got the 8. Down here I'm going to take the square root of 125. I'm going to take big R cubed. Now notice I've got a pi here that cancels. I've got a 4 down here and this is 16. So that becomes a 4. Um, so this is still one loop. Oh, I got an R squared here and an R cubed downstairs. So for one loop I get mu 0. The 4 pi's are gone now. I get a 4 from that guy, I get an i, and downstairs I just have a square root of 125 times r. Okay, and that's again for one loop. Now the thing is, each of these coils has capital N loops, and not only that, there's two coils, so it's going to be 2n. So the total magnetic field is going to be 2n times this. So that's going to be 8 times n times mu 0 times i divided by the square root of 125 r. That's our final answer. Okay, that's the final answer. That's the magnetic field due to these Helmholtz coils. Now, the good news is that same expression works for both experiments. The experiment we did with the magnetic permanent magnetic dipole oscillating in a magnetic field, that used the same coils. And so same N, 72, same R, 0.33 meters, um, different currents, so you'll have to use different currents. But everything else is the same. So once you factor out this part of this expression, everything but the current is the same for both experiments. So you can just calculate this number here once for both experiments and use it in both cases. All right. Okay, guys, I just wanted to point out that I've got data here. I'm going to share a link with you in the critic assignment that tells you the uh, results that several groups got. I had five groups, no, six groups, it looks like, doing this experiment last year. And this is the data they collect, and I'm just going to let you use their data um, because we can't actually do the experiment this year because of COVID. So uh, watch the video that I use to describe the magnetic field that's involved. Um, you can watch the video that... Uh, describes the actual experiment that's done. I want to take a minute now to talk a little bit about that experiment, but um, you should you should have the idea. Uh, basically, what we have is um, uh, there's a tube that has in it a filament and a can. The filament is a voltage difference V. Uh, between the filament and the can, and a little electron beam comes out of the can and goes around and hits a post. Okay, And the radius of that electron beam, the radius of that orbit of the electron beam, um, let's call that little r. This is not to be confused with the little r from the coil calculation we did a few minutes ago. This is just the radius of the trajectory of that electron beam. When you're looking at the data, uh, each pin has a number, and each pin number has a different distance. So I'll also 
provide those distances for you in a separate document. Um, the potential that we used last year was 29.5 volts, so this is in volts, and um, the number of turns of the coil was 72, and the radius of the coils was 0.33. So I'm going to uh, I'm going to pause here just a second and plug my computer in because I see I'm going to uh, turn off if I'm not careful. Okay, so uh, oh, I guess I'm over here. <laughs> Sorry. I can't keep track of which camera I'm looking at. Uh, let's go back and look at this one. So now I'm looking at this camera. Um, the point is there's an accelerating potential V. The potential difference through which the, the potential energy difference through which the electrons fall is going to be V times Q, whatever the charge on the electrons is. Um, that's going to equal the kinetic energy of the electrons. So if we know the accelerating potential, we know the charge on the electrons, we can work out the speed of the electrons they have as they go around the circle. Of course, if they're moving in a circle, we know the momentum principle it says mv squared over the radius of that circle. Okay, This r is the same as that r. Um, that's got to be equal to the force, which of course it's the magnetic force. There's a magnetic field here produced by these coils. Excuse me. That's going to be q v B, right? It's really QV cross B. I should, let's do it right. MV squared over R points is a force pointing toward the center of the circle. So um, this is going to be uh, QV cross B, right? V is the direction of the motion. V is the velocity of the electrons. Q is the negative charge on the electrons. So V cross B actually has to point away from the center of the circle. When I multiply by the negative charge on the electron, it's going to produce a force that points toward the center. So QV cross B is a force that points toward the center. Um, MV squared over R is the rate of change of the momentum of the electron as it goes around that circle. And also, that rate of change also has to point toward the center. As far as magnitude is concerned, um, I'm just going to write, since V and B are perpendicular to each other, V is into the page, um, I'm sorry, B is perpendicular to the page, V is in the plane of the page, so V cross B is perpendicular to both V and B. Okay, um, But the magnitude is going to be QVB since the sine and the angle between the velocity and the magnetic field is 90 degrees. Okay. Um, now, I can solve this expression for mv squared. mv squared is nothing other than 2qv, the potential. The capital V is the potential, uh, potential difference between the filament and the uh, cylinder. Little v is the velocity. So um, actually, I better solve this for little v, right? Do it that way and plug this in for little v. Since this v cancels that v, I'm going to plug that in for little v. What I'm going to get is m times the square root of 2qv over m, right? Uh, that's m times little v. Then I got to divide by r. Actually, I'm just going to multiply by r on the right. This becomes uh, QVR, right? Now, uh, this one factor of M cancels. One square root of M cancels that square root of M. So I end up with square root of M on top. This square root of Q cancels one of those. Two square roots of Q, two factors of square root of Q. And I end up with the square root of Q over here. So if I write this out, actually what I want to do, I think, just like we did last week, we want to solve this for b. So if I divide both sides by q, divide both sides by r, <laughs> then you can solve this thing for b. Okay, b is going to be what? It's going to be um, the square root of m over q. That gets rid of the m's and the q's. Then I'm going to get the square root of 2v divided by r. Okay, And what I think you want to do is to make a graph that's a straight line graph. And just like before, you want to make b, because notice this is the net b. b net 
it's equal to the coil B plus the Earth's magnetic field. And there's some conversation about the Earth's magnetic field in that video. We're going to get the Earth's magnetic field out of this for free. It'll, we'll get an estimate because it'll end up being the intercept of, of the graph. Okay? If we graph B that you calculate from the current that you measure versus this junk, you should get a straight line with a slope equal to this junk. This is the junk we're trying to measure, right? Square root of m over q. We know q. If we can figure out the square root of m over q, we put in what we know q is, we can get out the mass of the electron. Okay, isn't that cool? Uh, this stuff is all measured. That's the radius of the trajectory of the electron, and that's twice the potential. Of course, the potential is 29.5 volts, so we know that. Anyway, that's the idea. I hope that helps, and we'll talk to you soon.